Tower of London was old when Louis XIV was building Versailles. The tide of history had mellowed it when the Vatican was a blueprint. It is the oldest palace, fortress and prison in Europe. And with Windsor Castle, the only one to have been continuously lived in from Norman times until the present day. I was a prisoner in the tower for a long, long time, a long, long time ago. Of course, I'm just a ghost now, and I suppose I could haunt anywhere I like, but, oh, you know how it is, you get attached to places. Besides, I know my way about. We'd have given anything for a plan like that, because escape was ever in our minds. However, let me point out the rough shape of the place, the moat, the outer walls, some of us escaped that far once, but in the end we went out the usual grim way by Tower Hill, and our bones rest in the chapel of the tower, the chapel of St. Peter's Advincula. In fact, only 28 prisoners have ever escaped. The North Moat, the first obstacle to getting in or out. Richard Coeur de Leon had it deepened and widened. It seemed all right to me as it was. Legg's Mount Bastion, called after George Legg, Lord Dartmouth, constable of the tower in 1684. The North Bastion, a nice place. Nothing that I know of ever happened there in my time, and since the happenings in the tower were apt to be almost monotonously nasty, I used to find it restful. But history wouldn't let it alone, and in the Blitz quite a sizable bomb was dropped on it. The Brass Mount Bastion, it used to be armed with brass cannon. The east moat, all grassed over now, it used to be very wet and very, very dirty. This is called the Well Tower, and nobody quite knows why, because there isn't and never was a well in it, perhaps after a man named Well. The Cradle Tower, used as the jail for the less important prisoners, and the scene of an ingenious and successful escape by a Jesuit, Father Gerard. This is St. Thomas's Tower, built by Henry III. A famous traitor's gate is underneath it. The byword gate, where people entering or leaving had to give the byword, the password. Here's the main entrance. The old and the new. A yeoman warder in the costume of Henry VIII and a British soldier in modern battle dress. This is the lion gate. Here there used to be the lion tower where the royal lions were kept. And other animals as well. Leopards, bears, lynxes. Henry I had an elephant. Later it became the royal menagerie and was a great attraction to visitors until in 1835 it was closed and the beasts taken to Regent's Park to form the nucleus of the present zoo. The post of Keeper of the King's Lions was considered by no means to be sneezed at. John de Vere, Earl of Oxford for one, was glad to accept it when he was Constable of the Tower. It carried an income of 12 pence per day, with sixpence extra per lion. These white stones mark the site of the ancient tower. Even in my day, I used to hear speculation as to the future destination of sergeants, much of it pessimistic in tone. I can tell you where many of the nice ones go, to the tower, where they become yeoman warders. This is an Easter parade. The warders form part of the yeomen of the guard, but they existed as jailers, gatekeepers, and as part of the tower's garrison centuries before the yeomen. Here's the yeoman jailer. And there's a ceremonial axe and mace. When a prisoner was being taken off for his trial, it was the yeoman jailer's duty to march behind him, bearing this axe with the edge turned away from the prisoner. On the return journey, if the prisoner had been condemned to death, he carried it with the edge towards him. If not, as before. This axe is purely ceremonial. It's never drawn blood. The yeoman warders are the oldest fellowship of men in the country who have pursued the same trade through the centuries to the present day. The earliest actual record mentions a man called John of London, in the 14th century, until 1826, when the Duke of Wellington ordered that no person should be admitted to be a warder of the Tower of London but deserving, gallant and meritorious sergeants from the army, it was possible to buy a wardership for a fixed fee of about 300 pounds. Their numbers are limited to 40, and their senior officer is the chief warder, who is responsible for locking the gates at night. Their duties nowadays are to patrol the tower, take spells of duty at the gate, as you see, act as guides for visitors. And what they don't know about the tower isn't knowledge. Most of them live actually within the tower itself. Oh, and by the way, they're not strictly called beef eaters. They like it about as much as a policeman likes being called a copper. Yeoman warders, after years of good and faithful service, 
receive recognition from the constable of the tower. This is Mint Street, where the Royal Mint used to be until 1810, a reminder that one of the functions of the tower was to make and guard the nation's coinage. A bomb fell here in 1940, but caused no casualties, although the casemates are used as quarters for the yeoman warders. The tower lamps, which have taken the place of the old flares. This lamp is made from one of the old castle cannons, such as these. They may look pretty derelict, but they have their uses. Because these posts, if you look carefully, you'll see they're really old guns upended, and then as nails. Tower Hill is now a centre of soapbox oratory, and I've heard things said that in my day would have had the speaker boiled in oil. We'd have heard his screams for a week. When Queen Elizabeth was 21, and only Princess Elizabeth, she was accused, justly or otherwise, of conspiring to marry Edward Courtney, Earl of Devonshire, and to put herself on the throne. The plot was discovered, and on Palm Sunday, 1554, Elizabeth passed through Traitor's Gate to the cold comfort of the Bell Tower. Surprisingly enough, for one who was to become so formidable a queen, she showed extreme terror at her plight, and apparently expected to be beheaded at any minute. But she must have remembered her pretty mother, Queen Anne Bullen, who had come to the tower before her, never to leave it. And undoubtedly, she was badly affected by the close confinement, so that at the end of a month, she was allowed to take the air on this little promenade, which runs from the Bell Tower to the Beecham Tower. It can't have been much in the way of exercise, especially as, by order, she had to be accompanied by five other people. But though cramped, it was better than nothing. And she used the promenade so constantly that ever afterwards, it has been known as Elizabeth's Walk. The Salt Tower was rather the heresy and witchcraft department. Astronomers, Jesuits, anyone who was mentally or spiritually different from the general found an unwelcome lodging here. Here, efforts would be made to make them see what was considered the error of their ways. Learned divines would dispute and contend with them late into the night, and the sounds of religious altercation rose and fell monotonously. More often than not, verbal persuasion gave way to more physical inducements. There are many inscriptions in this tower, which, by the way, used also to be called Julius Caesar's Tower. And the most remarkable of them is the horoscope, which has been carved in the walls, and it bears the inscription, Hugh Draper of Bristow made this sphere the 30 days of May, anno 1561. It shows the relative positions of the sun, moon, and planets at every hour of the day and night. Hugh Draper was imprisoned for witchcraft, and when I look at his sphere, I'm not in the least surprised. This is the Lantern Tower, which is a modern building, built in imitation of the old one. Here's an old breech-loading gun. Incidentally, Henry VIII's filing pieces were breech-loaders centuries before the breech-loader officially came into use. This gun's dated 1464. Inscribed on it is this prayer. Help, O God, the Sultan Mohammed Khan, son of Murad, the work of Muni Ali in the month Rejeb in the day of the year 868. Still, I believe, the largest board gun in the world, 25 inches caliber. It weighs 18 tons and it fired a 600 weight shot. Astonishingly, it was used against British ships in the Dardanelles as recently as 1807, and very deadly it proved. It was one of 42, and the Sultan Abdul Aziz gave it as a present to Queen Victoria in 1867. Traitor's Gate, the door between life and death for most of the prisoners who entered by it. It was built in the 15th century, and when the river was a smoother highway than the rough roads which led to the tower, the most convenient entrance from the river. Later, in Tudor times, it became the most expedient. There was less chance of an organized rescue if the prisoner was taken by water instead of through the narrow streets of the town. Up the steps of Traitor's Gate have passed as prisoners, queens and princes, lords and ladies, Anne Bullen, Catherine Howard, Lady Jane Grey, and like Mary Hamilton in the old ballad, Long or ere they came down again, they were condemned to die. Underneath the modern bricks of this stairway, you can see the ancient stones of the original steps. The inhospitable gateway of the bloody tower was the prospect before them, and through that gateway the prisoners would go to the cheerless cells and dungeons allotted to them. No stones in the fortress are more steeped in blood and cruelty than these. 
The murder of the little princes by Sir James Tyrrell, supposedly on the instruction of Richard III in this bloody tower, began a series of grim events which more than justify the tower's unpleasant name. In this tower were bishops Latimer and Ridley imprisoned before being burnt at the stake. In this tower, Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, was murdered. In this tower, Archbishop Lord awaited execution. And here, Sir Thomas Overbury, in an age becoming increasingly sophisticated about murder, became the tragic-comical victim of the first British fumblings towards the perfect crime. Poor Sir Thomas, the reluctant guinea pig, was assailed by upwards of 22 poisons, including powdered diamonds and ground spiders. Finally, working like beavers, his poisoners succeeded in finishing him off with an injection of corrosive sublimate. Either they were very indifferent poisoners, or Sir Thomas had an astonishing constitution. The great portcullis of the bloody tower, which closes the main entrance to the inner defences. This portcullis is very old. Savage-looking spikes which seem to snarl a grim welcome are for the comparatively mild purpose of sticking into the soft earth to keep the portcullis firm. In my day, it was always kept lowered, and to arrive as a prisoner, perhaps in pouring rain and sleet, and be forced to wait while the machine laboriously creaked and groaned its way upward in its wooden channels was a depressing beginning to a story which in any case was unlikely to have a very happy ending. Here are the takels for raising and lowering the heavy gate. They're about a hundred years old, and they replaced the old system of chains, which needed 30 men to operate it. It was through this door that Sir James Tyrrell and his accomplices crept to murder the little princes. It's always supposed that their death was ordered by Richard III, and indeed, since his name had already been linked with the murders of Henry VI and the Duke of Clarence, who also stood between him and the throne, it seems a reasonable presumption. But whoever was guilty, Murdered they were, and their bodies hidden beneath a pile of stones in a dungeon in the Wakefield Tower. The constable, Sir Robert Brackenbury, who refused to take any part in so mean and bestial a deed, as he called it, had been got out of the way. And on his return, he ordered their bodies to be dug up and reburied by a nameless priest under the stairs leading up to the White Tower. He told no one of this, and his secret died with him on Bosworth Field. The famous picture of the two little princes. were not discovered until the reign of Charles II, when they came to light in the course of some structural alterations to the tower, in fact, when this door was being built. There's a brass tablet on the door which commemorates the finding of the bodies. The foot of this ladder marks the approximate spot where the bodies were found. Old guns on the wharf, with Thames running softly behind them. Guns of all kinds, from the east, from everywhere where the English have adventured. Guns they have used, guns used against them, guns men have fought till they died, guns taken without a struggle, guns of all shapes and sizes, some shaped grotesquely like this one, shaped like dogs and dragons. Now in their age, just old guns, for boys to straddle, for cats to sun themselves on, guns that in their pride, fresh from the foundry, must have felt as all-powerful as an atomic bomb, now just quaint, as obsolete as David's sling. And here is what was one of the early rackets. This curious twisted stick, had only to be brandished from the tower at any shipping on the Thames, and the wretched vessel had to disgorge a tribute of so much of its cargo. The brewers soon learned to prefer the overland route. Cross Tower Green, by St. Peter's Advincula, we come to the King's House, which used to be known as the Lieutenant's Lodgings. It was built by Henry VIII, and is where the governor of the tower now lives. In addition to being the Lieutenant's Lodgings, it was also a prison for people of exceptional importance. Queen Anne Bullen lived here before her execution and she carved her name Anne on the fireplace in her room. If you were rich enough, you could eat in the lieutenant's dining room. It would cost about five pounds a day, and I think the lieutenant made rather a good thing out of it. These leaded windows open onto the suite occupied by Queen Anne Bullen. And by way of complete contrast, this is the window of the room in which Rudolf Hess was lodged when he was brought to the tower. Lord Lovett, together with the other Jacobite noblemen of the 45, was imprisoned here for a time. One of the 28 successful escapes I mentioned was contrived from here. The escape of Lord Nithsdale in 1716, on the very eve of his execution. He must have walked through this door to freedom. 
This is the river side of the king's house, which looks so different from the front. This is the window of the governor's office, and above the window of the balcony is the window of the council chamber where Guy Fawkes was examined. Here's the window of Lord Nithdale's room. Down these stairs, disguised as a woman, he came past what is now the constable's offices, past these walls, now covered with portraits of former governors, portraits which bear the most illustrious names in military history. He walked quietly to freedom out of the front door and made good his escape. This is the yeoman jailer's house. It used to be half timbered like the other, but was later refaced with brick. Here's the front door. And here is Lady Jane Grey's window. It's a very horrible window. It looks onto Tower Green. And this 17-year-old girl, Lady Jane was no older, could see through it to where the scaffold was being built for her execution. She could also see her husband when he walked from the Beecham Tower to the block. She could also see his headless and bleeding body brought back for burial in an unmarked grave. What a strange story. She was Queen of England for nine days, then a prisoner in the tower, and then... and then she was on the scaffold, and she said to the executioner, I pray you, dispatch me quickly. Then the handkerchief was bound over her eyes, and she began to grope for the block. And she said, What shall I do? Where is it? She was guided to it. She laid her head down upon it, stretched forth her body and said, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so she ended. This is the site of the scaffold on Tower Green. And here's a list of those who died there. There weren't many, there were only six. And they died in relative privacy. The others died before the crowds on Tower Hill. The scaffold was about five feet high, surrounded by a wooden paling covered with black cloth. The block at one end, a flight of wooden steps at the other. The axe was usually hidden away under the straw which covered the floor of the scaffold, but sometimes the prisoner would ask to see it and to feel the edge to make quite sure it was sharp. The Duke of Monmouth did this and gave the executioner six guineas to do his work well, but expressed doubts as to whether the axe was quite as sharp as it should be. His doubts were only too well founded, because in the event it took five strokes to sever his head from his body. Tower Green is a pleasanter place now than it was. Now it really is a green with grass and trees. Then it was paved with cold cobblestones such as these bleak and grey, whence you could draw but chilly comfort, with the ravens foraging sedately for food and croaking gloomily from time to time. The ravens are still there. They are officially recognised and have cards of attestation on which their crimes and misdemeanours are recorded. A long road to the scaffold on Tower Hill. It didn't seem so long as we walked it. How well I remember it. Much seems unchanged today. How well I remember the cool wind blowing off the silver Thames the sweet scent of the trees, and how unconcerned with my fate a large blackbird. The wind is still as cool, the scent as sweet, now I am dust. Not much really has changed about the tower. The men who manned it, the prisoners who languished in it, they've gone. But the tower as much as it was. Here at last is the place where the scaffold on Tower Hill was. Here it was really a public execution. Thousands would be here for your last words, and you were expected to put up a good show. And most people did. Overshadowing the scaffold, is the memorial to merchant seamen of all nations who gave their lives in the first European war. This is the actual site of the scaffold. And this is the block and axe used at the last execution by beheading in England, a block that was specially made for Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett. As he was rather old and fat, the block was made rather higher than usual. The head of Henry Grey, Duke of Suffolk, the father of Lady Jane Grey. It was struck from his body at about nine o'clock on the morning of Friday the 23rd of February, 1554, very nearly 400 years ago. And by some extraordinary freak, it's been as perfectly preserved as any mummy of ancient Egypt. This is an old print of the chapel of St. Peter's Advincula, St. Peter's in Chains, the prisoner's chapel. The original chapel was built by Henry I, but time and a fire have so ravaged it that the main structure that you can see today is for the most part the work of Edward I with later additions by Henry VIII. And since Henry VIII, as you can see, it has changed very little. Here the condemned took the sacrament for the last time before execution, and here they returned to rest forever. 
There's a tablet in the chapel which commemorates the names of 34 of the most prominent people who died or were executed in the tower. Elaborate and rather touching memorials to various lieutenants of the tower and their families. Mostly 17th century. Here are the slabs of Queen Anne Bullen, Queen Catherine Howard, Lady Jane Grey. One of the flaws in the administration of the tower, and several of us made strong protests about it, which nobody took the slightest notice, was that while they were only too anxious to kill you, they didn't worry much as to where you were buried, or even whether. Consequently, your mortal remains were left to be hastily buried in an unmarked grave within St. Peter's. It was all too obvious that it was only a matter of time before the floor of the chapel became seriously undermined. And this, in fact, happened. The floor subsided, St. Peter's was threatened with collapse, and by the order of Queen Victoria, the bones were dug up and reburied behind these walls and in these chests in the crypt. Here the remains lay nameless and in confusion until they were sorted out. Queen Anne Bullen was identified with some certainty by the split bone of one of her fingers. This tablet commemorates those who were buried in the crypt. A tragic spot, the last resting place of innocent and guilty, of old and young, of traitor and martyr. That their bones lay for so long unidentifiably mingled, vividly symbolizes the blind injustice an undiscriminating cruelty of the tower, used as a tool of absolute and irresponsible authority. Different guns from those we've seen so far. They're firing a 61 gun salute in honor of the King's birthday, and they make a good cheerful jubilee thump. But the tower has heard other firing in its time, a thinner, harsher sound. Eleven rifles together in the gray chill of the morning. In this miniature range, where the enemies of England pay the penalty for espionage. The White Tower the oldest tower of the fortress, and its last and inviolate stronghold. Difficult as the tower was to get out of for a single person, it was even more difficult to get into for any number of people, and the White Tower has never been besieged. It was used in early times as a prison for captives taken in battle and held to ransom. King John Balliol of Scotland, King David Bruce, the Twelve Burghers of Calais, King John of France, Charles, Duke of Orleans, all these spent an enforced leisure here. From these little windows, the earliest prisoner recorded, Rafe Flambard, Bishop of Durham, in 1101, escaped by means of a rope smuggled into him in a cask of wine. There are four turrets at the four corners of the tower. The round one is the old Royal Observatory, before the building of the one at Greenwich. Old weather vanes, which are made of Sussex iron, and they date from Charles I. The doors to the White Tower. This used to be the main entrance. There were never doors we cared very much about, because most of the serious torture took place in the White Tower, and though the walls were too thick to hear anything through, we used to see the patient after treatment, and that was quite enough. This is the present main entrance, built by Christopher Wren. Gin and beer, two strange figures taken from outside an inn in Woolwich. They're made of highly polished wood, and are but two of the many interesting things stored within these forbidding walls. Here are old guns of all kinds. They're mostly British from Tudor times. Some are trophies taken in battle. This trophy is Italian, probably Venetian, and it's the Lion of St. Mark. It was captured by the French from the Italians, and we in our turn took it from the French. Here's a model of two knights riding what Mallory would call a full ding at each other. Now that torture has been abolished in England, and only the grisly instruments remain as evidence of our bygone cruelties, 
The White Tower is very much worth the haunting, and my favourite place of all is this armoury, where I've assembled some pieces of armour unequalled in the world. Armour for horses and men. It was no good being protected yourself if your horse was likely to be brought down by a determined thrust from a pike. Men in armour gleaming like silver. That, curious enough, is the effect of time plus elbow grease. When your new suit came from the armourer, it was of blued steel. And indeed, it's been something of a problem to keep this armour clean without scouring it away. The answer's been found by smearing it with goose grease. Many good judges believe this to be the finest set of horse armour in the world. If there is a better, I shan't go and look for it. It couldn't be much better. Here's Henry VIII in probably the most perfect suit of armour in existence, with a fluted skirt which is unique. The workmanship in the joints of this suit is so exquisite, particularly at the shoulders, that although made of steel plate, the whole thing is almost as supple as leather. This is but a fraction of the armour in the tower. All of it, whatever its quality, perfect in that every rivet, every thong, every plate is original and authentic. A strange iron mask helmet with ram's horns and a comic human face. It was given by the Emperor Maximilian to Henry VIII, and I can't help feeling it was by way of being a rude joke. Anyway, I know that I'd have hated giving it to His Majesty. I think I should very quickly find myself here in the torture chamber of the White Tower. It's now used to exhibit old guns and trophies. In this room was the rack to stretch confession out of you, one turn at a time. To be confronted by the grim mechanism and the stupid, unsmiling torturers must have been a daunting experience in itself, without going to further extremes. And indeed, the threat was often all that was necessary. This door, opening as we so often wished doors would, as if by magic, is 600 years old. Within this archway was built the little ease, a very uncomfortable cell about four feet square into which you were squeezed without much ceremony, the foot coming into play, and left to think things over. It's now been removed, but I still find myself trying to step over it. This is a gibbet where bodies were exposed as a warning after execution. A little invention called the scavenger's daughter. It kept you bent very double as long as the operator thought fit. Heavy iron collars. No spikes in them, just heavy. You began to notice them after the first week or so. Thumb screws. One of the minor pleasures. The chain was for giving little tweaks to emphasize any point that your inquisitor wanted to make quite clear. And an iron mask, kept on night and day, particularly agreeable when the beard began to grow. A very pretty little assortment of ironmongery. The Wakefield Tower, which after the episode of Colonel Blood has become the jewel house. It was called after a certain William de Wakefield and curiously enough, the prisoners taken at the Battle of Wakefield were imprisoned here. In the little chapel of this tower, Henry VI was murdered by the order of Richard Crookback. Here, by the stone commemorating his death, every 21st of May, the date of the king's murder, three lilies bound with pale blue are laid by a representative of Eton College, together with a bunch of white roses from King's College, Cambridge. After 24 hours, the roses and lilies are taken away and burnt. Here, safe and secure within the jewel house, lies the richest regalia in the world. The intrinsic value of these royal treasures is enormous. Their historical worth is beyond price. Here, set in gold, are precious stones from every part of the British Empire, stones from every quarter of the globe, from almost every period of time, from antiquity to the present day, from the ruby of Edward the Black Prince to the Star of Africa. Here, in this case, are gathered together all the jeweled emblems of sovereignty. The anointing spoon. The jewel-encrusted sword of state. The scepter and the orb, the gold spurs and rings. and supreme symbol of empire, the crown. As the evening sun splashes the grey stones with crimson, the tramp of the bank picket echoes along the ancient walls. The ring of their marching feet slowly recedes as they go to take up their post as guardians of the Bank of England during the hours of darkness. 
as the peace of evening falls on the ancient fortress of London, there remains but one ceremony, a ceremony that has been carried out without a break for 700 years, the ceremony of the keys. I can tell you no more of this than you can see with your own eyes. It is the same today as it has always been. God preserve King George. Amen. Amen. 